Hello and welcome to The Rugby Call. I'm Nathan Middleton and delighted to say I'm joined today by the former rugby flanker James Haskell, the Red Roses fullback Ellie Kildun and the World Rugby referee Wayne Barnes. We're going to focus on the rugby chat of course in just a second and our two incredible rugby charities Restarts and the Injured Players Foundation. But first, hello to everyone. I'm going to go around on my screen first. So uh, first is Ellie Kildun. Ellie, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm well, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm good. Are you okay? All good, all good. James, good. ask, how are you? Uh, delightful, delightful. Um, been, yeah, working hard, trying to keep myself amused, training a new puppy, trying to keep the puppy and my wife happy. Always difficult, always challenging, but uh, I'm having a good go at it. We might get some puppy interruptions during the call, I, I hear. Yeah, potentially. He's actually sitting at my feet um, at the moment. I, I Because we're sort of giving him proper food like raw food and all this kind of stuff the, the, the dog trainer's given us actual like chickens feet and it's like they're the rankest set of treats like the other day he had a proper cow's ear that was like black furry and was walking around with it like it was the best thing in sliced bread and he turned his back and i was like i'm not having that lobbed it in the bin it stunk but it was like still black and furry it was amazing it's quite interesting hask um since lockdown my wife's vegetarian um so i haven't had any meat at home. So the idea of some chicken feet sounds good to me. So send them across, mate. Send them across. <laughs> oh, Barnsley, if you look, I, I, Nigel Owens once sold me a care, a care package of Welsh cakes and a yellow card, just because he said, give me so many that I might as well keep it. If you need to tap out SOS, I will send you a, 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 a meat parcel that you can eat, like some sort of snacks where you can go, I'm just going to go to the garden. I've got to focus on some games and then just eat it. Because there's no <laughs> way you should be doing that. I thought you were looking tired. No, perfect, mate. Get them across. Get those chicken feet and some of those uh, meat snacks across to me. Well, all dog interruptions very much welcome uh, on this England rugby call. And a uh, very good afternoon to Wayne Barnes as well. How are you doing, Wayne, apart from uh, lacking in, in meat products during your life at the moment? I'm great. I was up in uh, Scotland this weekend uh, for the Scotland-France, and now I'm going straight back up north for, for Newcastle on Friday for a, a northern derby between uh, Newcastle and Sale. So it's great to have the Premiership back. I think I had about six days as an off-season. So, you know, always enjoyable to re rest, relax and prepare for yourself for the new season. Um, yeah, 31st of October was my last game in, in, the, in the Six Nations of last year. And then uh, my first preseason season um, game was Newcastle versus Ealing on the week after. So, yeah, perfect time to recover and, and recuperate. And imagine having to spend your six days off time in the Forest of Dean. <laughs> it's, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't get better than that. Nothing wrong with a forest of Dean. Rugby Heartland. Rugby Heartland. One day we'll get you down there for my charity game, Has. Yeah, I, could, I might become like team manager or something like that. Well, mate, you're not good enough to play anymore. <laughs> this is very true. This is very true. This is, this is why I'm talking about injured players. <laughs> we're we're going to talk about that in, uh, in just a second. And more rugby chat, uh, of course. But first, just our two rugby charities, Restart and the Injured Players Foundation. Restart is the official charity of the Rugby Players Association. It supports female and male professional rugby players in England during and after their rugby career who are facing serious injury, illness or hardship. The charity helps current and former players by providing emotional, financial, medical and practical support. The Injured Players Foundation, meanwhile, is the official charity of the Rugby Football Union and supports rugby players at any level and any age who have sustained a catastrophic spinal cord or traumatic brain injury whilst playing rugby in England. The IPF supports injured players through recovery, rehabilitation and the rest of their lives. And the reason why James, Ellie and Wayne have all donated their time today is so hopefully you can donate something towards these worthy causes. And to make a donation of up to £20, you can please text Rugby Call, that's all one word, Rugby Call, plus your donation amount to 70085. Each text will cost you your donation amount plus one standard message. All the information should be on screen wherever you're watching us. We can find more in the bio. For example, if you wanted to donate £10, you could, you could text Rugby Call, all one word, space 10 to 70085. So more rugby chat in first and second. But, but James, you joined the Board of Trustees at Restart early this year. Just tell us a bit more about why you wanted to join and, and the influence you're hoping to have. Yeah, I look, I'd always um, supported Restart as a player, right? It's one of those things where they come to the, the club and they say, listen, we're going to wear red t-shirts with Restart on this weekend. It helps players in a multitude of different ways. Do you want to get behind it? You say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because everybody in rugby is good people. They just do it, right? Do it without thinking. Because being a professional sportsman involves being 
inherently quite selfish. And a lot of rugby players are, are no different. And unless it affects you, you're not really ever focused on it. You know, until the house is burning down, you then wish you had house insurance and all these little pieces. And, and the sage advice that people give you and restart, I discovered, you know, I knew they were doing a great job, but I had no idea the level that they were going to to help players, you know, taking the sort of education side and restarting and players in, um, you know, new careers and, and stuff is, is a given. But what I didn't realise is the, the amount of work they're doing on mental health. And I know this is kind of, the zeitgeist is always about mental health now and it's what everybody's talking about. But to, but to be honest with you, um, you know, even if we have a, a privileged um, job in playing something we love and a sport, we're not exempt from uh, mental health issues. And the biggest killer of men under 40 is suicide. And we're, you know, we obviously, both in um, the female game and the male game, we, we look after and help people with, for example, an anonymous hotline, which people can call up when they're having issues and seek advice. And we offer counseling sessions. Um, and we've probably helped about 50 or 60 players, some of which we've stopped from doing stuff, you know, pretty silly, i.e. taking their own, their own lives. And we've had to step in a number of occasions. There's people reaching out all the time. And obviously, the world is kind of falling apart. Uh, and there are lots of people in very difficult situations. And context is, is always important with these things. You know, for, for me, my experience of COVID is different from somebody else's. But my experience of life is different from other people's. And there's lots of, lots of men and women out there who have issues who are struggling and restart provides that support and it, it costs about 70 80 thousand pounds a, a year in kind of counseling and therapy and um you know they work with some great partners to help fund that but actually because we haven't had our usual um fundraising and stuff and the, the rpa awards which we did virtually which is great but we haven't had the events there's no money left to provide this service at the moment. And we're pretty, pretty much in a, in a very dire situation. Uh, you know, we've probably got only a couple of months of support left um, to be able to help players. And obviously the mental health is probably the most prevalent. Uh, and, you know, they're also there to help, you know, people like my, Michael Fatia Lofa with, the, you know, his in, initial neck injury, and then obviously providing the funding and support for that. And while, you know, while the money, good money is raised, the restart get absolutely no funding from um, the the RFU or the or the clubs. So you know, all these players are there giving their bodies and lives for them, and you know, they 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 get a little bit of money donated from individual benefactors and sport events, but nothing. The clubs don't help at all. And, and to be honest with you, you know, the players' cognitive well-being and mental health is is paramount for so many reasons. So as soon as I found out this, I was like, Do you know what? It's all well and good wearing a T-shirt once when I was playing, but I, I wanted to get involved. You know, Ed Jackson was another one of the trustees who's kind of a shining light, an example of somebody that can deal with a pretty tough situation. And, you know, he's now, I think he did 22 marathons in, you know, in something like 10 days or something mad the other day. And he's, his recovery is incredible. Obviously, Ugo... Monier, who's a fantastic sportsman for, you know, and spokesperson for so many, for so many reasons. Um, and I basically said, to Ed, listen, what's, what, you know, what's the commitment? And, and, and we, you know, we, we discussed it and I just felt that I could make a difference and try to raise some, some awareness and restart doing, as I said, some, some brilliant work, but we're in, we're in a bit of a tough spot. So I think it, it's quite prevalent to raise some, some real awareness. Ali, obviously you're, you're a current player. Um, what Restart does for, for rugby players kind of past and present, how, how important is it to have that, I guess, support network that, you know, if you or players that you know could just, just reach out and be able to, to do something with it? Yeah, I think it's really important. Um, I think, as everyone kind of knows anyway, you play better when you're feeling good and you're feeling happy. Um, and especially, I think, as a, younger, as, as a younger player, it's really important to know the support that you've got on and off the pitch and that there is people there to to support you and to make sure that um things can run as smoothly um upstairs as well as being able to you know perform well on the pitch as well and i think it's really important as as james is saying to keep um restart going and to kind of allow people to use it as much as they can do um i play i played on uh, or um, warmed up in the shirt a couple of times um, and I've been part of um, conversations with similar to this, talking about it and talking to girls that are, are involved with it much more than, than what I am. And 
um, yeah, I, c- I can't agree enough with how how important it is to um, to be like part of it and to keep the support going, really. And Wayne, I know you've been helping out with the Injured Players Foundation as well, getting involved in some of their, their social activity and, and, and speaking to them a few Q&As. Just, just talk to us about that and why you feel the need to give back. Yeah, I just think on the restart point as well, and Hask has, has just got there, you know, getting closer to retirement. Ellie's nowhere near retirement. You know, she's just at the start of a, of a wonderful career. But as someone who's getting towards the end, you, you realise that need for support at the end of your career. You know, what is next? You know, someone who's worked for the RFU since 2005, it's, it's, it's quite frightening, you know, to, I, I need that support afterwards. You know, you, you, referees are in a similar boat, you know, they, they've dedicated their life to something they love. You know, they've given a lot to the sport and, you know, just to have that kind of bit of support afterwards is, is, is pretty, pretty special and pretty, you know, very much needed. Um, and then obviously the in, in injured players and um, foundation. Um, yeah. Like during lockdown, you know, we've all had those challenges and, and we've all had those, you know, those, those, you know, dark moments when you think, you know, when are we, when are we going to come out of this? This is a real struggle, you know, trying to juggle um, work, trying to juggle homeschooling, trying, you know, just not seeing family. Um, and so I was asked to join um, one of the um, IPF kind of uh, online discussions and um, are the energy and the enthusiasm um, some of the um, ex players like brought, you know, and, I'll tell you what, they've got an opinion, no, Nathan. So it was a bit of a and a and my chance to hear about what, you know, what they've been up to and, and, you know, and then to ask me some questions. But, oh, my goodness, they're rugby noses as well. They knew everything about every game I'd ever referee. They were highly critical of me. Talking about this, you know, decisions I'd given in the 2009 Premiership final against their team, I'm like, fellas, I thought this was meant to, you know, be, you know, you know, relationship building between players and referees. They're like, no, we want to talk about that, that forward pass, mate. Um, so they, they, they were great to get involved with. Um, and, uh, you know, one thing I was glad, uh, the majority of them come, came from England, is that I'd never refereed England because some of the, 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 the memories that they had of some of the referees who they said screwed over England, they were like, and what about him? Can you give me his number? Because we want to ring him up. It was, you know, some really great interactions with there. And a real decent bunch and, um, you know, and hope to be able to do them, you know, in person and catch up with a few of them at Twickenham once we get um, the fans in, in the stadium again. So when you're talking about the, the relationship between players and, and referees there, let's first get a take on what it was like to referee James Haskell during his playing days. And we'll get Haskell's view on, uh, on you during, well, you are still during your refereeing days, but uh, what was it like being on the, uh, on the pitch with Hask? Well, um, I always enjoy characters of the game, you know, and that's why, you know, I'm, I'm just reading the, this book at, at the moment. Um, just, to, you know, a character I really enjoyed and still enjoy refereeing. Um, and, and then there was Haskell, I, I'm, I'm afraid, you know. And, um, you know, I was looking back, Hask, my first premiership final um, was your first premiership kind of final appearance as well, 2008. You know, I was about... 17 and James would have been about 16 playing for Wasps um, and you know there was that fantastic back row at Wasps end of um, Delalio, Reese, and Haskell um, and you know Tom Reese went on to become a, a doctor you know his career obviously finished early um, such a shame you know such a talented player you know we got Delalio went on to be you know a World Cup well he was a World Cup winner at that point now a, an icon of the game and and then there was James um, <laughs> and um, but he, he always had an opinion, did Hask, and he'd always tell you about it. So James, your 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 thoughts, your memories on on uh, being refereed by Wayne Barnes? Yeah, look, uh, I th- you know I'm, I'm going to go for a different t- tact for for, for Barnes because I've always had the, the utmost respect for him. I think um, you know he's one of my it was one of my favourite referees. I, again, I like I like characters. I think uh, a referee is is a difficult um a difficult job uh, i think it's been made even more difficult these days when you know you used to be judged in the pub and that was it now now you're now you are on the same level of scrutiny as um as players and i think that you know some people handle pressure differently and i think some people um are you know kind of almost scared of that but but you know but but uh, Barnsley was able to 
um, maintain a personality and have confidence in his convictions and be able to be himself, which I thought was brilliant. You know, he was able to, to, to have a personality, he wasn't pressured. There's so many referees, when the pressure came on, they resort to like death stares or wouldn't be able to have a dialogue or wouldn't be able to control. You know, it's difficult. You've got two captains, you've got, you know, 23 players, you know, on each side with opinions, you've got, you've got fourth officials, you've got the crowd. But you know, to have confidence, to be able to have a dialogue, to be able to, to, to you know, have a conversation was, was brilliant. I really enjoyed him. You know, Nigel Owens, again, was another guy that I, I always got on well with. Um, but I always enjoyed, you know, Barnes, and, and I have utmost respect for him. You know, the fact he looked like a naughty schoolboy um, and somebody that I probably would have put his head down the toilet at, at school, he... You know, he was always, you know, because also if you know about him, how intelligent he is, how successful he is as well, like the other stuff, it was, it was really nice. And yeah, he was always very fair, always very honest. I, I think you could, when he came into changing, you could have a joke with him. You could have a, you could have a laugh with him, but he'd also go, do you know what? I don't agree or I do agree. I, I remember the, one of the funniest things was though, I, I was playing against, um, it was Leicester versus Wasp at the Rico and uh, Jamie Gibson, who, you know, we're not necessarily cut from the same cloth. And he was playing for Leicester at the time. And obviously his sole job was to razz me up and was pulling my, <laughs> my, pulling my scrum cap off, tackling me late, trying to razz me up. And I, and I basically, I think something happened and I, and I, <clears throat> I think I ended up belting him, not, not with a fist. And, and, and I, <laughs> I said to Barnes, you've got a, you've got to look at this. They're hitting me off 20 feet off the ball. And everything else. I was never, I never, I'd barely understood the laws at the best of times. So I never felt like I was able to, um, you know, to tell him his job. But I would say, actually, do you know what? There's a few little infringements. Could you look at it and let me know? I was always very respectful. Yes, sir. No, sir. Um, and uh, I said to him, you've got to look at this, Barnes. You know, he's hit me off the ball. He's cleared me out. He said, Barnes he said, no, well, I've seen I've looked at it. He hasn't. I said, listen, if you don't sort him out, I'm going to fill him in. And, and, and Barnes is like, whoa. In the middle of the game, he's like, you can't. You can't do that. You can't take Lawrence. I was like, I'm telling you, he's going to get it. He's like, you, you can't, you can't. And we had sort of had this awkward moment where I was literally telling him, if he doesn't sort it out, I'm going to fill him in. Um, whereby I slightly lost my head. So that was quite funny. But no, he was always brilliant. And I, um, I always enjoyed, uh, always enjoyed it. And yeah, he's like most referees, as I'm the most carded ever England player. I mean, he hasn't refer obviously refereed against England, but he's had a good go at me at Premiership. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. Um, you, you, we've all mentioned kind of the, the mental health aspect, particularly around restart and, and the IPA. And if, if just focus on you, obviously you've been a professional athlete in both sevens and, and 15s and, and came in from, from very early on, sort of 18 years old, I think you made your England debut. Yeah. What's that been like, I guess, kind of in the modern world with, you know, media platforms that there are, the amount of um, you know, TV coverage now on the Red Roses is, is huge. So the, mm. The mental aspect of, I guess, just focusing on your performance as well as a lot of off-field media distractions that you you have to deal with. Yeah, definitely. I think um, as when I when I first came in, I, I mean, I was still at college, and I, there was kind of the balance of of being a professional athlete and being a student, like all my friends were. And there was definitely um, there was definitely a difference between how I acted and how they acted, especially at Hartbury as well. People just love to have a good time and you know I would I'd be in for a couple of days and then out for for a week or so and there was a lot of pressure with that and then soon came social media around that time because um everyone would say oh a level student comes in and uh, is scoring in each game and stuff and straight away there was a certain amount of pressure that came on um the social media because suddenly I was faced with all the really good comments and then some comments that were more negative um, and I'd, I'd find myself sometimes looking for the, the hate comments as such as, as much as there wasn't many but I think already even looking at that at 17, 18 years old is, is something that I think other, other people would do as well um, just because the amount of time that you spend on social media whether you know it's late at night and you sat in bed on Instagram or just flicking through Twitter or even now TikTok or whatever it is, um, more people are using social media. So definitely there's more, um, there's more pressure with that. Um, more recently, I think I found a difference because there's not as much coverage in sevens. So when I was away at sevens, I was injured for quite a bit of that uh, period. Um, so I, I was in there for about two years and i I, I only had a handful of caps because most of the time I stood on the on the sideline, um, and there was a lot of comments around. Oh, where's where's Ellie gone? She's disappeared. Did she stopped playing rugby, and we didn't get many pictures. So my Instagram, I didn't have many like rugby photos or anything like that. 
So coming back into the 15s, I think suddenly I put pressure on myself to kind of um, slot in in the position that I left, um, if not better, because I wanted to come and not just be hidden, but to to, to be like, the best player I can be and for everyone to view me as that as well. Um, so off field, I, I mean, straight away, there's interviews left, right and centre that I haven't had to do in, in a couple of years. And um, I think not saying the right things, but not saying the wrong things is probably the, the thing that like there is a bit of like thought that goes into it. Um, but overall, I, I think you go through patches of, of tougher times, especially being a bit younger. Um, you know, you're coming into a team that is quite well established and ultimately, you know, you need to be playing, you need to be the creme de la creme because you come in and there's, there's going to be players that are a lot older that you, you're taking their shirt. So you, there's there's that, that it does get onto your back a bit. And I find, so I'm a student as well. Um, so I study at university as well. And finding that time to balance is is something as well as friends like as well as the outside part of rugby and having to travel between club and England I, at the moment I'm still getting used to I went from like a centralized sevens where everything was happening there to suddenly spending all the time in very different in very different places so the, there is a, that pressure but what has helped is having so many different people to talk to um, when I have found it hard whether that be coaches or or um peers and James if, if your experience is now you, you are kind of I know you're still inside rugby as in a media capacity but now you've gone from from the outside from from playing your experiences on I guess mental health and the way that the players speak about it during your playing days to now particularly in your role, role with restart yeah look I think um, one of the most important aspects is actually under focused on in sport in general but especially in rugby is the mental side of it you know if I tell if I tell a young player or a, a person do you know what if you buy these trainers you're going to run a little bit faster if you eat this food you're going to you're going to you know, feel better if you take this supplement you're going to look bigger they'll do it if I said to someone do you know what you could sit down and have absolutely no mental health issues no confidence issues I could I could improve your performance I could I could sort out your preparation but you need to go and speak to a sports psychologist or speak to a, a hypnotherapist or whatever if you visualize you know if you if you've got concerns about making mistakes and nerves I could take those away people don't do it you know if you asked me when I first started playing in a change room of, of, of 30 blokes put your hand up and said who's been psychologist there'd be me and probably one of the players who was eating glue or, or, or you know, eating studs or whatever, or, you know, that, that was it. That was it. And it was seen as if you didn't, if you actually had mental health issues, you had to go, you know, you, if you, sorry, if you didn't have specific mental health issues, um, you wouldn't speak to somebody. Now, I think there's a lot more dialogue, you know, around that, but I still think it's being neglected. And I think, um, you know, exactly what uh, Ellie was saying, you know, it's a human trait to go and seek out negative stuff. You know, you could have a hundred positive things said about yourself, but all you'll remember is a negative thing. I, I had it, I had, you know, for all my bravado and stuff, I, you know, I suffered from huge self-confidence issues my entire, my entire career, why I started seeing a psychologist in the first place. And I did what she did, you know, I, I went and looked on a WASP forum once after my first game, and it was the worst experience of my life. And it's, it, it's a form of self-harm, it, bizarrely, that kind, of, that kind of stuff. And I think... Now we're getting to a point where we, we are talking more about it, but it, it is still, there's still a stigma attached to it. I think, you know, for example, we, you know, we, we, this 24 hour sort of confidential helpline that, that Restart are, are doing, you know, there's 50, 50 players who are, who have picked it up, you know, per season on average and, and, and reached out and spoken to them. Um, but I know, I know way more who haven't, you know, who, who even just can't deal with the, the scrutiny on social media. You know, as I said about Wayne, you know, people used to make comments in pubs. Now people are sharing it. And I think, the, you know, one of the worst inventions for humanity was social media. You know, yes, there's lots of positive sharing and, 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 you know, learning and all this other stuff, but actually I think we could have done without it. And I, and, you know, for me, um, mental health is, is, in, is integral and it's need, it, you need to see it alongside, you know, your, 
your diet, your uh, you know your equipment, everything else. It's part of you. It's it's a, like a, it's an area of improvement. And just you know things like feeling motivated. That's great, but motivated is such a transitory feeling. You know you need to have mental fortitude. So when you don't feel motivated, you actually are able to play. You know when you do have a terrible game, you do make an error, and everybody's blaming you and coming at you, and, and you're, you're having sort of a you know, trial by social media. How do you handle that? And I think, I, think it, I think young players are getting better at it, but I also think that they are having to go through a lot more and we are, and people are going through a lot more. And I think, you know, you kind of the, the people who talk about mental health as if, you know, well, 40 years ago, there's no such thing as mental health. You know, people in, you know, less privileged com- you know, countries don't get mental health issues and have all this kind of stuff. Yes, but we now have about 50 things in our lives more so that can that can affect you more than anything you know you you have there's about 100 ways of making contact with people there's 100 ways of getting criticized there's 100 ways of sharing negativity and, and for players i think it's really important for so many areas for performance for uh for happiness for you know uh, uh improvement in ability there are there are you know a multitude of things and it's multifaceted and i think we need to understand that both as members of the public who are watching this, but also sports people and, and men and women not being frightened to share. And women are much more emotionally in tune and able to, to voice stuff. You know, obviously, sadly, Christophe Dominici, who I, I was coached at by at Stade Francais, you know, committed suicide, you know, and I said to my wife, I said, you know, so, you know, did you know that it's the biggest killer of men under 40? And, you know, such a surprise. And she went, no, it's not. I went, what do you mean? She went, well, none of you speak up or share anything about your emotions. You ask everyone how you're feeling. Everyone goes, fine. You know, and you're like, actually, I'm not fine. And I think we've got to break, break that. And I think we've got to be open. And being open and honest about emotions is not a sign of weakness. You know, uh, and I think that's something we've got to really consider. I think that's really interesting, Nathan, just listening to Ellie and James um, when my Wi-Fi wasn't falling off because of my daughter doing her ballet. Um, is that... It's important that people like Ellie and James talk to their peers and talk to their, their teammates and say, you know, and, and be real role models because it's definitely something that we've experienced in the refereeing front is if the senior guys, the people who have been around for an age, you know, the senior referees in a group are sitting back saying everything's fine and not explaining that, geez, yes, there, there's some real difficult times out there when everyone's having a crack at you. But if the senior guys and girls don't do it, then it's not going to be the, the, the person who's only just started refereeing in the premiership or an international kind of stage is going to say, well, actually, I, I feel a bit awkward because it be, needs to become the norm. And so to get ambassadors um, like we've got on the call today you know, with Ellie and Hask, um, people will feel more comfortable about it. And I definitely know that we've seen that from a refereeing point, that people are now willing to, to put their hands up and saying, look, I find social media a, a, a real drag on me, you know, how do I deal with it? How do I stop, you know, typing my name into Google and seeing what comes up? Because I can guarantee you as a referee, nothing positive is going to be coming up when you write in Wayne Barnes. Um, so, you know. How, how, my, my question for you, Wayne, is going to be, but like, as in, we've, we've heard it from a player's perspective. I mean, it's a pretty, I think we'd all agree, refereeing is probably a pretty thankless tax. If you do your job, you're just going to be like, well, that's your job. You're a referee. So, with within a, in an age of social media, you know, there's still obviously newspaper columns. You, you've kind of pushed yourself out a little bit and done some really interesting videos on explaining referee things now on Twitter. How do you switch off after a game, after you know a, a bad review or a, how do you? Is it is it family? Is it you know what, what do you know? How do you mentally switch yourself off from from that negativity? I, I definitely think the older you get, the more comfortable you you get in your own skin. You you accept you are who you are. You accept that some people are out there aren't going to like you, you know, you, you, I just, you, you just have to accept that, but you know, I'm a referee and, and I'm a lawyer, Nathan, so I'm never going to be bloody popular. Am I? Come on. Um, you know, and before you ask, um, ask, yes, I, I was bullied as a child. Yes. Yes. Um, so, um, you know, you, you just have to accept that. So you accept that, but also you, you put people around you who you trust, you know, whether it's your coach, whether it's your psychologist, whether it's your, 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 your wife, your partner, your husband, um, you put people around you whose opinions actually matter. Now, the opinions on here, do they really matter? You know, that someone thinks I've had a crap game up in Scotland, that someone's actually, you know, sent a message saying, uh, Barnes, we thought you got 14 decisions wrong against Team X or Y. Today. Does that matter? What matters is what the players, the coaches, and my fellow referees think of my performance. That's what really matters. 
Um, and then it's about being really comfortable at home and really appreciating, you know, the, the, the fun things in, in life, you know, and the things that matter to me are my family, you know, and my friends, you know, and if I'm happy in those two bits, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to be a bad week. I would say as well, it is interesting because I agree with everything Wayne's saying. And a lot of people say, you hear people say, I don't care. You know, people say, I don't care. It like everybody, you always care. But exactly what Wayne said is that like, the relationship capital of good people around you is, is what's valuable because, you know, why would you open yourself up for feedback who, you know, why would you get refereeing tips from a non-referee? What, you know, like you should always, if a hundred people are calling you an idiot you know, you might have to look at yourself. Like you can't go through life having no self-awareness, but if you've got enough awareness to understand that, you know, you're going to be open to criticism, but actually if your, your peers and your people say, you know, you've done a good job or this, is, this needs to work on, you have to be open-minded to take it on, but it's exactly right. You never go fishing and ask for advice. You know, it's like a lot of players, they go and ask their dads, you know, like I was get, you know, you want to make my dad proud. You know, what do you think, dad? And it's like, what qualifies my dad to give me any, uh, you know, any more advice than anyone else? It, he's just watching the game. Like, oh, was, he, was he a professional? Does he know what he's talking about? Does he know the game plan? What's he building it on? You know, all he sees, like most fans see, are the, you know, the, the big error, the big carry. Oh, so-and-so has had a great game because he scored two tries. Well, I've actually seen him miss 10 tackles, was late to six rucks and didn't do that. You know, Barnsley make, misses something in the game like a forward pass, but actually the way he kept the game flowing, the, you know, the way he dealt with those players, the way he diffused stuff, you know, the fact that he allowed, you know, to manage the tackle area. If you look at how he did it, you know, it, it, these people don't, they, they, it's never thought about. And I think it is interesting about referees because I, I had to stand up for one of your colleagues. I can't remember who it was, but I remember during yeah. a trial by social media, got thrown under the bus by somebody. And I'm very much like, I don't, I'm not into virtue signaling. I don't, I don't get in. I'm not like a, you know, a freedom fighter looking for the next thing to get behind, but I'm like, I believe in certain things and common sense. And I remember seeing that world rugby threw under a, co a colleague of Wayne's under the bus. And I was like, I was like, no, it's not, it's not fair. It's not right. You know, the guy's doing his job and we're all, we're all human. And I think we all suffer from that in sport. And I think people don't appreciate it. And they also think because you're in the public eye, well, it's okay. You've asked for it. You took, you took the hello deal. You took that money. You took that sponsorship. So you deserve to get it. It's like, no, no, no. Nobody deserves to get hounded. You haven't, you know, you haven't made a deal with the devil so you don't get to do it. And I think we've got to break this, this barrier. And my wife and I talked about on our podcast about some health issues around relationships. And uh, some bloke wrote, go, yeah, but, you know, you guys haven't had any normal people on. I was like, what do you mean normal? Well, and I was like, we, we're all normal people. We're the same. This is why it's so funny, the world of celebrity and stuff where we put people on pedestals and you find out, you know what? They do laugh. They do cry. They have bad days. It's when you see a celebrity lose it with somebody. They're like, oh my God, do you see so-and-so were angry? It's like, <laughs> yeah, we all get angry. We all have bad days. We all wake up. I sit in this chair the whole time I do podcasts and sometimes I look around going, what the hell am I doing? Like what, you know, we, 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 have, we, have, we have these moments and I think it's really important, like you said, so we, 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 we break down these boundaries and even, you know, even guys in that England team who played on the weekend in both the Red Roses and, and, the, and the men's side have good days and bad days. Just because they have a great game, you know, what goes on behind those closed doors, you, you never know. I think so as well on that, on, on that point, I think um, with the you're saying that it's normal people as well there was a piece that one of the girls did um at wasps um because it's it's, it's not professional and the you know at, at the club we've got people that are neuroscientists and teachers and engineers and just all these different jobs and you don't realize that sometimes they might come to training and they might be a bit snappy but then you've got to remember they might have been at, at school teaching and and one of the kids have just been horrible all day because you kind of forget there's that that there is that normal side of it. Um, and I think in women's rugby, um, a lot. I mean, after the game, as much as we like, oh, no, we won the autumn internationals and we've been made um, number one in in the world and stuff. There's still people saying how poor the women's game is and how like the we shouldn't be put anywhere near the men and things and it's that that mental side of it is it's just draining it's really draining because it's like we train just as hard we there's, there's girls that put so much time and effort in that in a job that they do nine till five and then go to training after 
and the mental battle that they must be going through to try, try switch off from one to go into another must be incredible um and that's the whole like normal side because people may just see us in the weekend and just think oh yeah okay she had a bad performance or yeah she played quite well but really like the, there is all the other other stuff going on as well so you've all kind of given examples there and, and things you've, you've gone through and, and, and things you have to deal with. So if I could get something from you all about how you then deal with it. So how, I know Wayne sort of asked how you, how you switch off, but, but Ellie, if you can just, just go back to you, I guess, you know, 2020 for everyone has been COVID, there's been lockdowns, you know, did, was there, was there, you know, did you make yourself go out for a run? Was it, you know, getting yourself a dog? Like how, how, how did you bring positivity to your life through all those mental challenges that you've said before about social media and, and everyone day to day at the moment has got mental challenges. So, so what kind of gets you through the days and the weeks and particularly this year? Yeah, well, the, fir- the first lockdown, I had a, the opportunity to go to my family home up in Yorkshire and I haven't been able to go there for longer than a week since I was 15 because I went to Hartbury when I was 16. Um, so spent a lot of time up there in like, just in the countryside, spending time with my brother and my, and my mum and my dad was really nice. And it was a really good way to kind of switch off because it felt like I was a kid again um, and I could do all them things. Um, this this lockdown, I've been fortunate enough to carry on training. And I mean, for a couple of weeks of it, we've been away. But this whole lockdown has kind of has been that as much as it's not really a switch off from rugby. It's just been a, a refocus and a shift from focusing on to one competition being the Olympics to suddenly being put into a position where I might have to refocus into something else. So it was wasps. And then I, I was given the opportunity with, with England again. And it was just really putting everything I can, I can do into that so much off the pitch. I started making videos and saying, I, I keep saying to everyone, I'm going to make a vlog and I'm going to really hammer in on that. I keep putting, putting polls on my Instagram and getting everyone to vote and stuff. And every time I go to do it, I like half finish. I've got about seven half finished videos on, on my laptop that I just haven't got through. And I mean, as much as I asked my mum for a dog, I mean, she just keeps on saying that. The moment she says I'm too young, too young, and the landlord won't allow it. So maybe next year, she said, if if uh, we win the World Cup, she'll get me a dog. So hopefully, COVID won't be a thing then. But hopefully, I'll have a dog by that point as well. James, you, you have got a dog, which I assume is just not just your mental health, but just joy in your life. But just, I guess, as well as a dog, some other things that have, you, you mentioned earlier, you know, you, you spend a lot of time in that room, sat doing podcasts and a lot of online things. So how, how, do, you, how do you stay positive during, during a day? Well, it's actually interesting because I, I try to get a dog under the guise of one of those self-help dogs. You know, the ones where you're like having a bit of a sad day and they bring him in and they talk to him. I don't know what there's actually a specific name for them. They're normally like, them playing, aren't you? where they, they kind of, you know, if you're really scared of flying, that sort of dog. They, yeah, they've got a jacket and they're like, I help anxious people. I tried to say to my wife, can I get one? She was like, you're always angry. I said, well, because people are always coming at me. So if I had a nice little dog to stroke, I would calm, I'd calm down. I'd probably stroke it bald. But um, emotional no, we actually, support dog is what you're looking for. An emotional support dog, but but I, she wouldn't buy that. Um, but actually, I've my wife was very much like anti dogs. Was like I don't understand dog people. You know, this I don't want it. We've had this dog a week. She's turned into mental dog lady, like <laughs> mad dog lady in terms of like. I it was supposed to, was supposed to put it to bed the other night, and I was like, come on, and I asked it to wake up, and she went, no, shh. Bertie I was like whispering to it as if I was going to wake it up too loud I was like you've lost the plot you've lost the plot um, but in terms of like the, the, the positivity side I think there was one time in the first sort of lockdown where I had a moment where I sat here and I was like all of my stuff is public facing so the DJing the afternoon speaking the corporate speaking all this kind of stuff was was you know the, the, the filming for different people and stuff and show, TV shows and stuff was all public it, you know without that what, what was I about and I actually got back to really simple things of routine. So routine is something that everybody uh, needs and doesn't realize that, you know, if you, so what I did is I made sure that I woke up every day, set my alarm, woke up, uh, went and trained, whether that was in, in the garage or, or just in, in, in the house, ate my food and then and broke my day down to d- different areas. So I basically had a purpose, you know, set myself an hour for emails. And then, do you know what I thought to myself, this is a great opportunity to do stuff that I'd never done before. So I started doing live DJ streams, a bit like Ellie. I was like, oh, I was a bit, you know, bit, oh, I wanted to do it, but I didn't really do it. And the problem is if you, you can be like a couple of things in life, you can be like a sniper 
waiting for the perfect shot, the perfect video, the perfect moment. Or conversely, you could do like a mini gun and spray everything. Or you can fire a few shots and see how you, you see how you get on. And the live DJ stuff, I taught myself to do it. I'm a big techno keno anyway. You know, I got a camera, I started streaming, I started doing live streams, and I really enjoyed that. And then I said to my wife, I wanted to set up a a podcast with her she's like what are you talking about we said well let's talk about you know relationships and couples and sex all this kind of stuff that's um you know because people always say couple goals bizarrely but we're not you know we aren't we fight like cats and dogs we have problems like everybody has but this perception through social media is because nobody ever po- posts a bad photo that's something else to remember nobody really ever goes i look hanging here's a photo here's a terrible <laughs> meal i had at a harvester, let's have a photo. They're going to go, wait, no, I'm in, I'm in Dubai having Nobu, or this is my, look at my filthy Peugeot 206 car. And they're like, no, this is my Ferrari. So people forget that. People forget that you're selling a dream the whole time. So we wanted to dispel dispel that myth. And I, and I found that by doing that, and, and basically I applied for some online courses, and I was like, do you know what? I split everything in my life down to little, little incremental areas. So diet make sure I woke up, uh, had my breakfast, looked after that, wanted to stay in shape during this lockdown. Training, okay, let's have a plan. I want to work on my mobility. Uh, mental side of it, okay, let's do some courses. Let's read a little bit more. Uh, creativity. And basically, if I, by every day I was like 1% better in each of those. And by the end of the lockdown, I came out of it all right. But that's not to say I didn't have a meltdown halfway through. And my wife was great. And this comes back to what Wayne said about good people around you. She got the notebook out and she said, right, listen, how, you know, how do you make money? What do you do? What do you enjoy? And we sat down and she was like, oh, actually, do you know what? This podcast is going to help this and this is going to help this. And I suddenly felt better. And being quite simple minded, all she had to say was a few words. And I was like, back on. She wanted to have an hour chat. But I was like, no, no, you've got me back on track. We're okay. She's like, no, but we haven't talked enough. I was like, no, no, we're fine. Um, so, yeah, that's what, I, that's what I do. And I think, you know, I, 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 do, I spoke to a psych, uh, my psychologist through this period of time, um, started to work with a couple of different people and just, I'd call them up and do like a Zoom call and, and they'd be like, how's your week been? And you just vent. I was a venter. I was like, well, this has happened. This has happened. This has happened. This has happened. You know, what do you think about this, this? And then after an hour, I was like, do you know what? I feel, I feel better. I'm back. Let's, let's go again. And Wayne, finally, just your tips are for positivity all around. We've heard from Ellie and James. Um, well, well, my wife, Polly, um, she, um, Hask has already mentioned a lot of the um, kind of restart fundraisers, our big corporate events. She's um, involved in big corporate events and looking after charities at her firm, um, Fireball. And so she's been massively affected um, by this. So I've been hugely impressed by her, first of all. She, she retrained um, as, um, as a Pilates instructor. So she started off by, you know, in, um, doing some lessons with her friends um, and then, you know, her friends invited friends. And now, you know, four or five times a week on a 6.30 um, in the morning. So, you know, I, I've not set my alarm for that early yet. Has. She's downstairs um, doing a Pilates lesson um, and loving it. You know, she's from a dance background. Um, so she's really engaged in that again. You know, we, we hope that we see that corporate sector um, back again, you know, um, soon you know i think we all are desperate to get out there and see people again and speak with people again um but i have been so impressed with how you know she's you know face that adversity um and it's it's starting to think about you know ways of interacting with people so she's helped me um set up i'm back on twitter after about 15 years of being off it so um hopefully i can help kind of explain which is a complex game at time you know throw the book you you know, hashtag, I think that's how you pronounce it. You can tell I'm all over this um, social media, Ellie and James, you can tell. I'm a hashtag throw the book and he'll tell, you know, give James some tips around how he should have played the game. Um, so, um, um, and, and also like just little things around getting out, you know, having some lovely walks around the Surrey Hills. I live in Twickenham. I know Ellie's just around the corner um, in, in Hampton. You know, you tend to stay at Richmond Park or you go up to Bushy Park, but some friends said, look, get down to the Surrey Hills. So we've had some lovely walks around the Surrey Hills, get that exercise. Um, we've done some things as referees as well, believe it or not, us refs get on all right. You know, we're the only people who talk to each other. Um, we've had some like virtual wine tasting. We had An- Andrew Sheridan, the ex-prop from, um, you would have played with him. Um, he's a big wine kind of buff down in uh, the south of France. We had Scott Berger all sending us kind of advice on wine tasting. So we've done a few virtual wine tastings, you know, just anything to keep us engaged and active and 
you know, as um, I think as, as Has said, you know, that idea as well of just sitting back and saying, what do I enjoy? What, you know, or as Has said, what makes me money? You know, what, what do I really want to do? You know, and, you know, some of those things that we've been able to do in lockdown, um, it's just it's just been nice, a nice, nice refresh. Um, and now, you know, the last three or four weeks since the premiership's been back up and running, you know, it, it's back a bit to normality. We're still over at Twickenham. We're still training as a group. Um, and it's great to see, you know, all the familiar faces of, of the premiership referees. And, you know, now, now the international window started again. We're, we're trekking around the country. Um, we've been to, been to France, stayed in a hotel, went to Italy, stayed in a hotel, went to Scotland, stayed in a hotel. I haven't seen any of the cities, but we've seen some really nice hotels in different cities. So um, we're back to some normality, but we all want it back to normal. We want to be out there. We want to see the red roses at Twickenham. We want has to be on the sideline uh, talking about the games at Twickenham. And I want to be running around the middle of the park at Twickenham as well. So some, uh, some positive messages there. Uh, the reason, of course, just a reminder why James, Ellie and Wayne have all donated their time today is so hopefully you can give something towards these worthy causes in Restart and the Injured Player Foundation. To make a donation of up to £20, please text Rugby Call, that's all one word, Rugby Call, plus your donation amounts to 70085. Each, each text will cost you your donation amount plus one standard message. So just that example again, if you want to donate £10, it would be rugby call, all one word, 10 to 70085. I think we're just about done there, guys. James, Ellie, Wayne, thank you very, very much for your time. I, I could carry on speaking about dogs and mental health and everything for, for hours more, but um, we're going to have to call it a day. Thank you all very much for, for participating. Thanks all. Thank you. That's it for Rugby Call this time from England Rugby. We shall see you next time.